Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons to Jesus Christ in himself, according to the intention. I'm going to switch out the word a little bit closer to the original. He predestined Jesus Christ in himself, according to the kind. Romans chapter 8. We'll start from verse. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again. But well, you have received a spirit of sonship, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the for we eagerly await, or for the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And then verse 23. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our sonship, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see through perseverance, we eagerly uh, we wait eagerly for it. Now, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, but we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Maybe we can battle with a further word of prayer. Lord, well, we thank you for leading us through this weekend. Lord, thank you for sharing your heart with us concerning your eternal purpose. Lord, we thank you that even as, as young people, we have the chance to be able to hear Lord, what it is that is in your heart. And our desire is somehow, Lord, we may be able to respond. So Lord, help us to be alert this morning. It's been a long weekend already. Lord, we may, may you quicken our uh, mortal bodies so that we may be able to hear you, be able to process uh, what you want to say to us. We pray this in essence in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So we've been sharing on this matter of God's plan for man this weekend. And uh, before I I continue, I I promise you I will find you the reference to the verse I was referring to yesterday. And it's in Isaiah 40, 26. Um, Isaiah 40, 26, it says, Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. And uh, I mentioned this in the context of the fact that 
you know, scientists believe there's over a hundred billion trillion stars. It's kind of mind-boggling. And uh, and however, here is a a really comforting verse. And we said that these stars are just burning rocks, right? They're, they're not alive. But the one, uh, but here it says the Lord leads them, leads forth their host by number, and he calls them all by name. So he has a name for each one of those stars. And then the last phrase is even more um, comforting. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Think about it. All of those stars, he knows them by name, and not one of them is missing. And uh, the Lord even mentioned, you know, for the sparrows to even fall to the ground, um, he knows it, right? So brothers and sisters, if he can remember the names of all those stars, don't you think that he knows exactly what's going on with your life? He knows exactly how you're feeling, what you're going through through the day, and the struggles that you have. He certainly knows about all of that. And so it should be a real comfort that God loves us. And he has a wonderful plan for us. And his desire is that we may cooperate with him, that we may find that purpose, understand it, and really live out a life that is worthy of his calling. Brothers and sisters, um, it, it is a wonderful journey um, that he has called us to. And he has a glorious end. Now, may we be willing to cooperate with him. And uh, in that context, we earlier read a verse. We all know this. God causes all things to work together for good. Now, sometimes we say that just as an encouragement to our brothers and sisters, right? Maybe even unbelievers know that. But brothers and sisters, there's a context to that verse because it says uh, we all know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, brothers and sisters, God has a plan. And he's not just the architect of a wonderful plan, but he's also the one that is the builder. Right? So the Holy Spirit, every day what he does is, you know, have you ever seen, um, uh, if you ever been to Pennsylvania, they, especially in the Lancaster area, there are um, Mennonites there, and they're, they're believers. They, had a, they have some special beliefs about staying pure and, and being faithful to the Lord. One of the wonderful things that you will see there is they're famous for, uh, for uh, making quilts. And uh, the, the special thing about quilts is they patch up little, little uh, 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 pieces of uh, fabric and make it to these beautiful uh, comforters, and you can you can buy them there. But they're really wonderful. But you know, one time we were visiting, and I asked him, you know, how long does it take to make one of those? He said about three months. And um, whatever you pay is not even worth whatever they the time that they spend into it. I mean, it's a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm sure, they're just making money. But the point is, um, it's piece by piece. Right, and uh, if you read uh, in the Bible that uh, we are his craftsmanship, so the Holy Spirit, stitch by stitch, is building out, building out this beautiful tapestry of our lives. And so, do you even know that? And so, hopefully, you'll catch on to that and understand what his purpose is. And so, um, as we come back to the theme of God's plan for man. And we said from the beginning, God's desire was somehow that life would fill this earth. And that somehow uh, man would be uh, obedient to God. And that his life would grow and become mature and be able to run things. And be able to know how to reign this earth. Now, I'll give you an incomplete example. And I'll give you, uh, and this example worked many years back. But... And I think it still applies today. Uh, but please uh, hear me out. Now, the example I, I give is of Donald Trump, the businessman. It is before he became a politician. So my focus is really not on the politics aspect. But he was a, um, a successful businessman. He failed many times. And then, you know, over time, he rebuilt up his wealth. And before he entered into politics, um, he was a 
But um, the reason I bring him up is because he named, he had a son, he named him Donald Trump as well. So his name is Donald Trump Jr. And there, is, there was some thought behind that, that in naming him Donald Trump Jr., when even when he was a baby, there was a desire in, in the father's heart that, you know, hopefully one day my son can grow up. He can make something of himself. He, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, he contribute to society, but not only that, that one day he would become like him. And one day he would have the skill set to be able to run his business. And so that one day he could say, look at my son. And, uh, uh, and I can basically pass on my business to him. So, uh, you know, Donald Trump went to Wharton, but, you know, arguably the, one of the business, business schools in the world. And Donald Trump Jr. also went to Wharton. And uh, for, for many years ago, Donald Trump had a, had a show called The Apprentice. And it basically, he trained people how to run, run businesses. And what he would do is he would bring his son and his daughter to the show as well. And they would participate and learn how to, I guess, grade or evaluate these folks. But brothers and sisters, ultimately, his plan, his goal was that one day, my son could grow up to be like me. And then he could take over and run my business. And then one day Donald Trump can say, this is my beloved son and whom I'm all pleased. So you see, uh, the example is really to help us to realize that this is what God is doing. Now, he, we, we sometimes, especially in Christendom, our focus is, and I think the enemy actually does this, he wants us to just focus on the fact that, yes, Jesus died for me, I'm going to, I'm going to heaven. And, um, Yes, we should preach the gospel that more people can be saved. But sometimes we forget that that was just that is just the beginning. To be born again is just the beginning. Um, uh, now it's a wonderful thing we already mentioned that Nicodemus discovered that there was a parallel, right? When he was born, he he needed to have that first suck of the air, right? Maybe he was spanked and he cried and he then he could suck in that first breath of air and then he started to live. And then we said the same thing, the, the Lord was drawing comparison that the Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life. And that we need to breathe in and to be born from above. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But brothers and sisters, we come back to Genesis, where God's plan was somehow that our lives may not just stay there, but we may grow up. When we grow up, then we may find the other half. This afternoon we'll talk a little bit more about that, finding the other half. But then why? So that there may be more life. So once your life is mature. Now, I mentioned that when we were kids, we are very self-centered, right? Um, my, my daughter uh, recently got her first job at a daycare. And uh, all and they were all two and three-year-olds. And for the most part, they're, they're really cute when they're not crying and screaming and yelling and fighting, right? So she had this wonderful idea that, oh, it would be wonderful just to work with two or three year olds. And I think she only worked work there for like a month and she's like, I'm done, right? So, because these little babies are so selfish and um, they only think about themselves, right? They cry, they don't care that, um, you know, someone, you know, daddy and mommy would be on an important call. They're, they're crying, and especially during COVID, right? You would, you know, you'd be in meetings and, and in the background, you know, baby would be crying and then the parents would say, oh, sorry, my kid. Is, is acting up, right? So brothers and sisters, um, God's plan was somehow that that we not just be born again, but that our lives may grow up so that one day we may be useful in his kingdom. And we may be useful in such a way that we may be able to learn how to run, to, to reign this in this world. So um, if you read in Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 1, uh, there Paul tells us, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is an owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, 
that we might receive sonship. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, if you pay close attention, there are two words mentioned there. One is a child, and then there is a son in the same passage. Now, here is a story that Paul was telling that in those times, especially uh, a well, a family that was families that were better or well off, they would have many servants serving them. And what would they do? They would allow their kids to grow up with the other servants. And some of these servants, they were not just being servants, but they were probably skilled craftsmen as well. Some of them maybe were um, carpenters. Some of them maybe were blacksmiths. And what would they do? They would train their children on how to be a, a craftsman, on how to um, you know, learn math, learn different things. And so they would grow up with the slaves. And then until one day, the son, the, the child grew up. And then the father would throw a big banquet. And what was he doing at that banquet? He would say, this is my beloved son. Now he's all grown up in whom I'm all pleased. And so brothers and sisters, you see that? That is what the Bible talks about, sonship. Now, in some translations, uh, in the portion we read, is it, it translates adoption of sons. Now, the reason why adoption of sons is not such a great translation is because adoption usually refers to the fact that um, you are adopting someone that was born, um, who was an orphan or born out of wedlock, and they're given up for adoption, and then you go adopt. Because that life is actually a different life. But here, it's not that way, friends. It's the same life. And um, so uh, when we read in, in, in Romans chapter 8, it said, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Brothers and sisters, isn't that what happened? We already talked about the life of the Lord Jesus. He was perfectly obedient to the Father. He did whatever the Father asked him to do. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, his life was so abundant and so full that it permeated his whole body, that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes were so white. And then what did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm all pleased. So brothers and sisters, what was it that the Lord Jesus did? He's, he, was a, he, was, he set the way. He set the example. So just as he lived, that one day we would also live. So that's why he gave us his life so that his life may grow up and be transformed in us, okay? Now, we, um, we talked about uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 because in the context of, in verse 23 it says, Now may God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved completely without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, we already mentioned that we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. And the Lord's salvation is also complete. The spirit, the soul, and, and the body. Now, um, uh, now, we already talked about the spirit, right? We said that it was dead. We could not communicate with God. But now, when we're born again, when we're born from above, now we have become alive. So salvation of the Spirit is a done deal. It happened already in the past. It's something that is already done, right? So uh, if you read in Romans chapter 8, it talks about three things, justification by faith, sanctification by faith, and glorification by faith. Now, justification by faith speaks about the fact that because the Lord Jesus died, we no longer have to die. Justification by faith speaks about that story of Passover, when the, the blood of the lamb was applied to the lintel of the, of the doors, they were passed over. Now the blood of Jesus is applied to the lintel of the door of our hearts. Now God has passed over us. We are justified by faith. This is what Martin Luther discovered, right? We are saved by faith, right? And we are justified. Because when God looks at us, he looks at and sees the blood of Jesus, we are justified. Now that is the past, and it's already happened. It's a historical fact. Once saved, forever saved. Now we, our, our spirits are quickened. 
Our, our spirits are alive. We can commune and call the Father, Abba, Father. Right? So that happened in an instant. Now, we are spirit, soul, and body. Now, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about the resurrection. Um, verse 50, 1 Corinthians chapter 50. Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Behold, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Brothers and sisters, here Paul talks about the salvation of our bodies. In a twinkling of an eye. Now, if we're alive when the Lord Jesus comes back, now, hopefully we will be raptured, okay? And now, if you're raptured, you're, you're going to heaven, right? Now, um, we know that our bodies can only handle so much altitude. Um, now, many years back, uh, we went on a church history tour, and I took my daughter and we went to Europe, and one of the, the, the stops was Switzerland. And there is a place there called Jungfraujau, uh, which is essentially the highest mountain uh, where you can get to by train. So we took a train and we went up. And uh, they actually have, when you get to a certain height, they call it the snow line. Because above that line, it's all snow. Uh, to, but the thing is, you also discover that there's no greenery above that altitude. It's because it's so high, oxygen is really thin. Now. I remember it was really exciting because Switzerland is beautiful. So if you ever have a chance, uh, you know, you should visit Switzerland. Besides New Zealand, you should also go to Switzerland. <laughs> it's very beautiful. But we were taking the train up, and it was just, you know, in, on the bottom you could see rolling hills with, with um, cattle and these beautiful homes that, you know, European style is just wonderful. And as you go up, you, find, you get to a point where it's just a, a snow line. There's no more life because the oxygen is so thin. So finally we got off the train, and when I got off the train, I, I felt a little woozy. I was like, whoa, what's going on? And apparently, I every step I took, it felt like I had just run like two miles because my muscles were achy. Because oxygen was so thin, it was, it was difficult to breathe. And, um, so my, my daughter did worse than I did. She, she was like ready to pass out. I actually had to carry her because she couldn't handle it. And it's the first time I've ever been to a souvenir store. They, they sold canisters of oxygen. It's just uh, anyway, but that's the point. But it was, um, so there you start to appreciate being on the low ground with, with oxygen. But in any case, but so just one day, we're going to be raptured uh, into heaven. You need a body that can handle that altitude. So in an instant, Paul says, the perishable is going to take on the imperishable. Now, for you young people, you don't really think much about this probably. But for us older ones, as our hair starts to thin and start to gray, and I told you I can't read anymore without reading glasses, but you know, and I need to get you know 16 font Bibles. You start to discover that our bodies start to decay because of sin, and um, and I don't know if you noticed, I, I have a slight limp because my knee now swells every once in a while because 15 years ago, 16 years ago, I tore my ACL playing basketball, and uh, what happens nowadays now is every so often I am reminded that I injured it because apparently my doctor told me that I probably have some loose meniscus in there. And every so often it gets caught somewhere, 
and then you know the body tries to do something and then it swells up. So I'm I'm constantly reminded that I'm no longer 20, right? And uh, and it just it just swells up. So we look we should look forward to the day that there is no more sickness and no more death, and especially for for in all seriousness for for those of you that dealt with loved ones that have been sick with cancer with other things. One day, all of that is going to be swallowed up. And as a matter of fact, sin itself is going to be swallowed up. Today, we have to live with it. But here, Paul talks about the fact that one day, in a twinkling of an eye, in an instant, our bodies are going to be transformed. Now, there's some wonderful things about um, the new body. Now, and, and the, the real hint is, remember when the Lord rose from the dead and Mary Magdalene came to the tomb? And she didn't recognize him. So he looked different because the Lord already had a spiritual body. But once he spoke, she started then finally recognize who he was. So it's going to be a little bit different, probably. But he could probably still... Uh, but the other thing that happened was, remember the Lord appeared to the disciples and he showed Thomas his scars, right? So you know, even this spiritual body, is going to, he's going to carry his scars. Um, and we're going to be reminded that he died for us, right? So um, now, especially for for Chinese people, they're like, well, I wonder, do we still eat afterwards, after we get a new body? Well, um, the Lord actually did eat with the disciples, so the new body can eat. Now, the other thing that is interesting about the body is the Bible says the disciples were, were, were gathered and they were all afraid for their lives because they were associated with the Lord Jesus. And uh, they were together in, in, in the house. And then the Lord suddenly appeared in their midst. So you know the bodies can go through walls, right? So if you ever had a dream of going through walls, one day it will be a reality. And clearly that, that body can also fly pretty high, right? So the Lord Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Most High. So brothers and sisters, so in the twinkling of eye, and the Bible, Paul says not all of us are going to sleep. Now if we're still alive, we overcome, we'll be raptured. And those that have already died, they will they will raise up, they will rise up from the dead. So the angels will have the responsibility of picking up, you know, finding uh, you know, all the those that have died and then they will resurrect and their bodies are gonna they're gonna get a new body. Okay. So here we here here, so you see this. Salvation of our spirit happened in an instant. The moment we believe Jesus is our Savior, we are saved and born again, right? Salvation of our bodies also is going to happen in an instant. Now, the question is, what is happening today? And so, um, I think we need to turn to 1 Peter. First Peter, um, chapter one. Uh, this is a wonderful portion of the scriptures. Um, verse six. First Peter, chapter one, verse six. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes through te though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiry. Brothers and sisters, here's an interesting phrase, verse 9. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, brothers and sisters, aren't we already saved? How come Peter here talks about obtaining the salvation of your souls? So now, brothers and sisters, we come back to the fact that when God saves us, he saves us complete. The spirit, 
the soul, and the body. Now, um, when we, when our spirits were saved, the moment we believed in the Lord Jesus, we were born again. Our spirits were quickened, and we were alive. Okay, that's that's already done. So we are saved. That's true. Now, when our bodies are going to be changed and transformed, we are going to be saved, right? Our bodies are going to be saved. But today, the, the years that we have here on this earth, according to Peter, we are being saved. So brothers and sisters, it's not just that we were saved. Yes, our spirits were saved. But today, we are being saved. Our souls are being saved. And then one day our bodies will be saved. Okay, so there's the past, the present, and the future. Okay, so there's three parts. Because in, in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about justification by faith. That happened in an instant. That corresponds to our spirits being saved. Our sins being forgiven, we are justified. Sanctification by faith talks about today. We need to be sanctified. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then one day, we are going to be glorified. Okay? That's the future. So, brothers and sisters, we were saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. Justification by faith, sanctification by faith, and glorification by faith. Now, brothers and sisters, what is it that the Lord is doing? Now, justification talks about the past. talks about our sins. Right? Um, and that is a done deal. But sanctification by faith talks about the fact that we said the Lord already gave us this life. Now, that life needs to bear fruit. There needs to be an um, outward manifestation of the life that is within. That is sanctification by faith. Sanctified means to be holy. What does it mean to be holy? To be separate. To be different. Now, brothers and sisters, we are being sanctified. We are being changed. We are being conformed to the image of the Son. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, the, 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 in Galatians chapter 5 says, the, the deeds of the flesh, or, or the manifestation of the flesh, are sexual immorality, outbursts of anger, dissension, factions. That's all we, who we were in Adam. But what is it that the Lord is doing? He's changing us. He's transforming us. Today, so that we can live a holy life that's different from everybody else. Now, when everybody else is is out, you know, you know, uh, partying or or uh, or in sin, right? In high school and college, I'm sure you met your classmates, right? They, you know, I remember in college when I would walk down on Monday morning, especially if there was a row where the fraternities and sororities. It was just the smell of beer, right? Like, and you could see like all of these uh, uh, recycling bins with cans and cans of beer, right? So you know what happened over the weekend, right? So, brothers and sisters, this is what happens, right? Because of sin, right? They, they, they let's party hard because tomorrow we die, right? So that's the the model for the world. But brothers and sisters, for us, we are to live a holy life that's going to be different. Now, whenever other people. They love to curse. They love, love to take the Lord's name in vain. We live differently. We our language should be different, right? When everybody else is is um, is um, uh, dealing in sensuality and sexual immorality, we keep ourselves pure for the Lord's sake, right? That's sanctification. This is what the Lord is doing today. Now, if if you read though, uh, even in Peter, he says, even now we have been distressed with. Various trials. Now that process of being transformed and being conformed to the image of his son is not necessarily an easy process, right? Because the, the Bible says, Paul says, God causes all things to work together for good. Now, are you willing to allow the Lord to change you and transform you? Um, now, if you are, if you're saying, Lord, I consecrate myself, or may you have your way, then things are going to start to come. There will be difficulties, right? He may give you a difficult parent. He might give you a difficult spouse, a difficult boss. And But what is it that the Lord teaches us? He said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, brothers and sisters, 
What happened in Genesis? Adam and Eve said, I don't need God, right? I can live my own life. I, when, he's, when they say I, that's the self. That's the soul life. Now, what does it mean to deny your soul life, deny yourself? It means that, naturally speaking, I may have a desire to do something. I may have a desire to, to, um, to do this and do that. But what the Lord asks of us is sometimes we have to deny ourselves. Now, um, I don't know if you ever had this experience. Maybe you're in an argument with your sibling or an argument with your spouse or, or your parents. And, you know, when, argument, what, what are, when arguments happen, we usually try to one up the other person, right? Like you try to, like, um, if, if they say something and, and, and you can't sleep for a night, you want to say something so they can't sleep for a whole week, right? That's that's how we are, right? It's interesting. The Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, in some ways, you're like, well, that makes sense. But why is it that God said that? Because our flesh, our natural instinct is, if someone takes my tooth out, I'm going to knock all their teeth out, right? That's how we are. That's how that's how we are. But God had to put a restraint on us because our natural inclination is, if someone, you know, um, trips me, what do I want to know? I want to kill them. So that's why you have these road rage incidents, right? Which makes no sense. Someone cuts you off, and then they start getting into an arm, and then someone pulls out a gun and, and, and kills them, right? So it's not, com you know, commensurate with whatever you got. So that's why God had to put a restraint on them. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Because knowing us, we would go way overboard, right? But isn't it interesting? The Lord said, in the Old Testament, yes, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But in the New Testament, in Matthew 5, 6, 7, the Lord says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you should turn the other cheek as well. And if someone takes you your inner clothing, you should give them your clothing as well. If someone makes you walk one mile, you should walk two miles. Now, in those days, um, the Romans had a law. They were, they were you know, they wanted to be known as some a, 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 a nation, a, a kingdom that was law-abiding. So a Roman soldier could tell anybody, say, "Hey, uh, take my bag from me." But they would know they could only ask them to walk for a mile, and then after a mile, you could drop that bag in helping the Roman soldier because that was the law. You cannot carry it for more than a mile. But here the Lord says, if someone asks you to take carry it. Back, you, you do the extra mile as well. And when someone strikes you on the right cheek, now you know why is it the right cheek and not the left cheek? I don't know if you ever thought about this. Is if someone, and assuming people are usually right handed, if someone hits a slap you, right? If they slap you like this, that's your left cheek, right? Like if someone slaps you like this, it'd be your left cheek. But if someone slaps you at the back of his hand, it's your right cheek. That is the most insulting slap, right? When someone strikes you with your, the back of their hand. So that's why it's, it's described as someone strikes you on the right cheek, you should turn the other cheek. So if someone really insults you and makes you feel like nothing, what did the Lord say? The life within, the life of Christ, is able to turn the other cheek. Now, there's a story of, of uh, Pastor, he was he was speaking about this Matthew five six seven. It says, you know, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, you should turn the other cheek as well. But there was someone in the uh, audience that came up and slapped the pastor on the cheek right after he said it. And then the pastor got so angry, he took the Bible and started hitting that man on the head and said, "May the judgment of God be upon your head." So, brothers and sisters, naturally speaking, our our natural life is not able to turn. But what is Matthew 5, 6, and 7? It's a description of the life that lives in us. It's a description of the life of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus, he died for us while we were yet his enemies. But on the cross, you remember what his prayer was? Father, forgive them, for they do not know it. Brothers and sisters, that life is a, is a very different life. Now, brothers and sisters, so that every day we have a chance to say, do I want to elevate myself, or do I want the life of Christ to increase in me? Now, 
There is a cost to be paid. You have to be willing to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow it. Now, our natural tendency, when we argue with our spouses, with friends, with our brothers and sisters, is we want to keep on escalating. But, brothers and sisters, if you slow down, and if you listen to the voice within, you might hear the voice when someone says something about you, and you're about to say something back. The Holy Spirit inside of you sometimes says, stop. Don't say it. It's okay. Brothers and sisters, that's the time of the taking of the cross and following the Lord. Brothers and sisters, sometimes you know that if you get into an argument, it will get really bad, right? And you know that it might take you and that person maybe a few months to kind of get over that situation. But if you stop, and you allow the Holy Spirit to restrain you. You deny yourself, take up the cross, and say, Lord, for your sake, I'm willing to submit. Then you'll see there will be a very different outcome. Now, um, I remember uh, uh, probably like, this is probably two years ago, I, I, I work for a company called ADP. It's not important, but I was hired by a man that I really admired. I, really liked him and I worked for him for about a year and he was very reasonable he was great and but at some point he had to move on to another job now uh, he uh, so now I needed to work with uh, a different person and this person uh, who's my current boss he uh, he's actually uh, he has a he's very short tempered and uh, and uh, He's, I don't know if I should say this, it's not important. He's, he's a little shorter and a little heavier set, right? And, and so, I don't know if you've ever heard of Napoleon syndrome, right? But they, they somehow, anyway, this is my boss, okay? So when my boss was leaving, and it just so happened that at that point, my project wasn't going very well. And so we had to delay the project and so it's really bad circumstances, and I was really stressed because now I had to report to him, and he was short-tempered. He was—he would always go straight to the point, and he would berate me, and and um, I was having a really difficult time. Um, and then I remembered, obviously, you know, from my past experiences, what I will always do is I would complain. I would complain to my wife, I would complain to my dad, I would complain to other co-workers. You know that's what happens in office uh, politics, right? People just like to talk behind each other's backs. Um, oh, sorry, I don't want to dissuade you, those that are still in school. Uh, but the work environment is not always the best environment, but there's a lot of backstabbing and all of that. And, and uh, it's very easy to get into a mode where you're just complaining. But somehow the Lord convicted me at that time. And I said, Lord, I know that all things work together for good. And I know that this boss was given to you by me, given to me by you. And so, Lord, I'm going to submit to your will. And then for the first time, I, I, I actually said, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, I will submit because I know it's from you. And uh, because you explicitly designed this environment for me so I can grow up. So you know what? It's very interesting. The moment that I did that, and I truly from my heart said, Lord, I submit. Even if he's mean, even if he's nasty, even if he loses his temper, I'll take it from you. And you know what happened? Within a month's time, my boss started to change. And for some reason, I started to really understand him. He's a straight shooter, but if you do what he says, and, and, and there are no problems, and, he, and he's not surprised, he's great. And he gets out of your way. And um, just recently, I told another coworker, I was like, I hope my boss never leaves because I love working for him. I know exactly what he wants. Now, you never want to get him angry, but if you do what he says, he's actually quite reasonable. You know exactly. So, for instance, there was a perspective that the Lord changed and changed me. And I grew up, right? And so I knew that didn't come from me, and I knew that had to come from his life. So brothers and sisters, this is what the Lord is doing. He's changing. He's saving our soul. Now, I said, um, from going from, you know, outbursts of anger to the fruit of the Spirit, what is he doing? He's forming his life in us. Uh, John the Baptist said, may his life increase and my life decrease, right? 
So one, as you slowly by surely, on a day-to-day -day basis, as you go through these experiences, you take up the cross and follow the Lord, you start to see that you start to change slowly but surely. And what happens? You maybe didn't have love in the past. Now you have love. Now, my, my wife, um, this is something that my wife had to learn. Growing up, she said, you know, they would never have guests come over to their house. Um, but my, when I grew up, I grew up in a Christian home, and my parents always taught me, uh, because Paul says we have to be hospitable and without grumbling, right? Um, it's real easy when you're trying to be hospitable, people come over to your house, and um, there's a lot that goes on in the background, right? So any of you that have had people come over, you know, once they come over, you know, there's a lot of issues to be washed after the fact. You have to clean the floors. They may not do things the way you like them to. Um, maybe you have, uh, you know, maybe they move your furniture and, you know. So, so if you ever go visit a brother or sister, please remember that there is a lot of cost being paid in the background and, pre and learn to appreciate and learn to help the host, right? You know, and if, you, if you have some time. The easiest thing for us, oh, this is wonderful. I just come and I leave. So when I was growing up, there was a, a brother and sister. Uh, they turned out to be my, my brother's wife's in-laws. So, um, but anyway, they used to, every Lord's Day, after the meeting, they would invite. Now, at that time, my parents were, my, my dad was teaching in Taiwan. And uh, my brother, my sister and I, my, my sister and I were, were in high school, I'm sorry, we're in school and my, my brother was working, but we're still relatively young, about your age. Every Sunday, um, the, this brother and sister, they would invite us over to their house. They would, she, she would cook a big meal for us and we would play volleyball in their yard and we would play board games every Sunday. And uh, looking back, what they did was they provided an environment for brothers and sisters to be together. Now, we didn't talk about spiritual things every, every time, right? We were just hanging out together. But as a result of being in that lovely environment, we started to build together, one, uh, build, build each other up, one another, with one another. But now that I look back, they paid a huge cost in order to have us every Sunday. Now, I don't know about you, but every Sunday after the meetings, I'm tired. Like, I always take the longest nap Sunday afternoon because you have a whole day of meeting. But now that I look back, that brother and sister, they didn't spend their time taking a nap. They were cooking for us and cleaning. And so you start really, and you start to appreciate the Christ in them. And you see that they were willing to lay down their lives for these young people. So brothers and sisters, this is what you start to discover. That as you lay down your life, now, um, Paul says that may we see each other, have this attitude which was also in, in Christ, right? He was equal with God, but they considered equality by the subject of Christ. In there, he also says, may you see one another as more important than yourselves. What is a sign of maturity? Is when you start to think about other people. It's not just about you anymore. Now you start to think about your other people, your brothers and sisters. How are you doing? Right? Um, now, in order to care for one another, there's a price to be paid. Right? So, um, uh, I remember a few, a few times, uh, there would be a, a sister that would, that would call my wife. And when, as the phone rang, I could see she was hesitant. She says, I have dishes to wash. Oh, like an hour and a half of dishes to wash. If I pick up that phone, I know that sister's going to talk to me for like at least an hour and a half, right? And so you, you've been there, right? Now, do you pick up that phone or not? Or you pretend you're not home, right? I, I think maybe some of us have gone through that because there's a price to be paid. Um, and so taking up the cross and falling blood may be as simple as picking up the phone. And willing to give up an hour of your time to listen to someone, you know, say how, how sad they are for some reason or the other, or the help that they need. And so, brothers and sisters, there's a price to be paid now. But as you pay that price, you start to discover that you start to grow. Then 
the love of Christ starts to grow. The patience of Christ starts to grow. The uh, gentleness of Christ starts to grow. Um, and so there is a work of transformation. Now, do you remember uh, when the Lord first called the disciples, there were two brothers, James and John. What did the Lord call them? The sons of thunder. Why? Because they were angry young men. And you remember they came to Samaria and they didn't receive the Lord? And James and John said, Lord, do you want us to send fire and consume them? Right? And the Lord said, wow, you don't know what kind of uh, spirit you have. But isn't it amazing that after they followed the Lord, eventually John became the apostle of love. Remember? Now why? Because John saw the love of Christ for him. Now in the word of, in the Gospel of John, uh, there, there's this word bosom. It only appears twice. Once is in John chapter one. It said, "He who is in the bosom of the Father, which is the Lord Jesus, right? He has explained him." Now we know the Lord Jesus was the one that was in the bosom of, of the Father. But then there was another instance at the Last Supper. John describes there was one who was in the bosom of the Lord. The one who was in the bosom of the Lord Jesus it was himself. He discovered that he was loved by the Lord. So he was so touched by the Lord. And John was the one that recorded that when Jesus had died, the Roman soldier pierced a spear through his side. John was the one that testified and saw that water and blood came from his side. John heard the Lord pray, Father, forgive them for they did not know what they did. John saw when the Lord Jesus died and that spear went through his side. Brothers and sisters, John was so touched by the love of the Lord. He was, and because of that, he was willing to follow the and he was transformed from a son of thunder to an apostle of God. Brothers and sisters, this is what the Lord is doing today. Now in ourselves, um, we already said, there is darkness, there is sin, we fall short of the glory of God. Now, um, uh, you remember the story of Jacob, right? He was, um, his name was given to him because he grabbed on to the heel of his brother when he came out, right? He was a really smart man, a crafty man. And the Bible says he loved to be at home with, with his mom when his brother loved to go outside and hunt, right? And so, but you know that Jacob, when he was at home, he was scheming, right? How am I going to cheat my brother out of his birthright? How am I going to cheat my brother out of, um, uh, of the blessing? That's exactly what he did. He did to such an extent that his brother wanted to kill him. And then Jacob had to leave. But what happened with Jacob? On the way to, um, on the way uh, that night that he had to leave home, because now he cheated his brother, he knew his brother was going to kill him. So his mother, uh, Rebecca, sent him away to Laban. I remember that story. And that night, Jacob was very lonely. Now, he was a mama's boy. Right? He never left his mom inside. And that night he was alone and, and he had a dream and he saw a heavenly ladder that went up to heaven. He said, this is nothing but the gate of heaven, right? And, and he there, God appeared to him. And what did Jacob say? Well, if you bless me, I will make a pillar for you. And, but the thing is, Jacob, he knew the things of this world. He wanted to gain this whole world for himself. And uh, now I told you, the descendants of Jacob, the sons of Israel, in Babylon, they learned to be the best businessmen. Right? Even today, I said, you know, I said, there's a joke right, that says, be careful when you talk to a Jewish man because money in your pocket is going to end up in his pocket. But where did that come from? It came from Jacob. He was a crafty man. But the Lord blessed them, and they're very successful businessmen today. And if you divide the, the riches of the world into three parts, the Jews own one-third of the world's riches, okay? I think the Chinese are catching up. But anyway, so you see, the Lord really blessed them. But Jacob was crafty. But what did the Lord do to Jacob? He found someone even craftier to deal with him, Laban, right? He found his uncle, who was even worse than Jacob. And so he said, well, you want to marry my daughter, Rachel? Okay, work seven years for her. So he worked seven years, and it is as if it never went by because he loved her so much. 
And the night of the, that they were to be betrothed, uh, Laban did a switcheroo, right? Gave them Leah. And he discovered the next morning, oh, that was not Rachel. So he had to work for another seven years for Rachel, right? And, um, and then, not only that, he had to work another six years for the livestock before Laban was even willing to let him go. So 20 years, Jacob suffered. Now, I don't know if you remember, but at the end of his life, Jacob met Pharaoh. And um, I'm paraphrasing, but Jacob said something to the effect that, you know, my, my life has been very hard. And um, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but, but, but days have been difficult. Well, Jacob had a very difficult life, 20 years. Not only that, Jacob ended up with four wives, right? Now, trust me, one, okay, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> one wife is plenty. Now imagine four wives. Now, Jacob had to deal with all the, you know, the, the different complainings and the emotions. Sorry, I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> okay, the boot swings and all of that. But you know what I'm saying. So the Lord took him through a real difficult time because he was changing it. But remember what happened when he met him in uh, Penuel and, and uh, the, uh, there he wrestled with God, right? And then the Lord touched the socket of his thigh. And from that point on, Jacob had a, had a limp, right? And so what was that a picture of? Was that God, he wrestled with God, and in some ways, God let him win, but he didn't let him win. So Jacob was no longer the same. So what did God do? God changed his name from Jacob, the grabber, right? Of course his name is the grabber. He's a crafty, deceitful man that was grabbing and wanted the whole world. He changed his name from the grabber to Israel. Israel means prince. So brothers and sisters, this is the work that the Lord is doing for us. Now, in, in, in Isaiah, it talks about Jacob as being a one. What was the story of Jacob? Now, the first time he came, uh, he, he left home. He saw a glimpse of heaven, right? He saw that ladder, but he barely paid attention to it. And that place name was Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And, it, it, and he said, this is the gate of heaven. Jacob barely paid attention to it. But after Jacob came back, 20 years later, Jacob went and lived in Bethel. So brothers and sisters, what does it mean? For Jacob, he only knew this world. He only knew about gaining this whole world, right? But, so the Bible in, uh, in Isaiah calls Jacob a one. Now, what was Jacob's story? Jacob's story was he wanted to crawl all over this earth and, and uh, gain this whole world. He wanted to grab all the blessings of this world. But what was it that God was doing? God was changing him and transforming him. And so that one day he would become a butterfly. Now, a butterfly now no longer is concerned about the two-dimensional world, but is now starts to know the third dimension. So the Lord wants us not to be concerned about the earthly things, but the heavenly things. Now, what happens? in the process of metamorphosis. Okay, well, here we go again, biology class, right? Um, so you know that the worm, the caterpillar, um, I don't know if you ever read the book, The Hungry Caterpillar. I remember reading to, to my kids, that, that was my favorite book, right? And the, 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 the caterpillar, all they did was eat and eat and eat and eat, and that's basically what they're doing. And because, as I found out, that some butterflies, they only live for a few weeks. They don't even eat sometimes after they become a butterfly because they ate so much as a caterpillar and prepare them for the rest of their life. Anyway, very interesting. So, you know, the caterpillar eats and eats and eats. And then what happens? Then he builds a pupa, right? Is that what it's called, a pupa? It's kind of like a... Yeah, it's like a, it, it, I think that it, it's P-U-P-A, I think. And basically, it, it closes itself with this thing. And something happens after a few weeks that that caterpillar becomes a butterfly, right? Um, and brothers and sisters, this is the work of transformation, tra work of metamorphosis. So the Bible described Jacob as a worm, but then one day he became a butterfly. So the things which he suffered. And so brothers and sisters, if you think about it, um, um, 
What is it that the Lord is doing? He's doing a work of transformation. Now, I'll give you another example. Um, now, uh, you, you, for those of you that are, um, I don't want to say they still have those. De Beers, right, the producer of diamonds, always has these commercials, right? It says, a diamond is forever. And uh, they are the ones that gave out a, uh, a, uh, a guideline. Of course, they're going to give out this guideline that if you're going to buy an engagement ring and propose, it should be two months salary, right? That's that's the guideline, right? Of course they're going to say that because they want to make more money. So why? Well, you give an engagement ring because it's a very precious stone, right? It's very very pricey and it's a sign of your love for a significant other. So that's why people spend a lot of money to buy these these diamonds. And uh, uh, but did you know? The, that in order for that diamond to be produced, there is a, a, a difficult process, right? So what is the process? Now, the 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 uh, uh, when the the, um, the diamond is basically carbon, okay? Now that has gone through a special process. Now, if here's a pencil, right? And uh, I don't know if you use pencils that much anymore. We just type into Right? Anyway, here's a pencil, and inside this pencil there is what we call the, the graphite, right? The, the pencil lead. And if you, the, the reason you can write with the pencil, why? Is because you put enough pressure on, on the pencil, and because this carbon, this uh, graphite is very brittle, it starts to break into pieces. The little pieces start to make a trace, a trail of little graphite pieces. So that's what's on your paper. It's little pieces of this graphite. It's very brittle. It's dark so you can read, right? And it breaks off very easily. But if you take the same carbon and you put it in the heart of the earth, where it's very hot, and you apply a lot of pressure, and you give it a few million years, then a carbon, a, a, a diamond is produced. Now then what they do is they take the rough diamond and then they take it to the best diamond cutters in the world, which again happen to be Jews. Uh, they're the best diamond cutters in the world. And, um, and then they cut it in such a way that that diamond now is able to encapsulate the light. Okay? Now brothers and sisters, the same carbon that is dark, opaque, brittle speaks about us. We are dark, or opaque, or brittle. We break easily. Probably now more than I tell my, uh, but anyway. So we break very easily. Um, and uh, But what is it that the Lord is doing? He causes all things to work together for good. He puts us in an environment where there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of pressure, and then his hope is that one day we can be transformed from a very brittle, dark thing which is something that's transparent. Not only transparent, but what is diamond? Diamond is the hardest material known to man. You can actually use it to cut glass and use it to cut other diamonds, right? And, and what is the special feature of that diamond? Because it's transparent, if it's cut a certain way, now, if you, uh, now the thing about a diamond is, if let's say you're in a dark room, you have to turn on the light to actually see the diamond, right? Because otherwise, you won't be able to see it. So the special feature is the diamond is not the light itself, but it captures the light. And if you cut it a certain way, you see the glory of that light in that, I guess you can call it a vessel. Right? And that's why it's worth a lot of money. So some, for something brittle and dark to become something so hard. And um, that is what the Lord is doing. Now, brothers and sisters, when the Lord gave us his life. The nature of Christ is in us. Now, what, what do we discover? That as a believer, sometimes we have patience, sometimes we have gentleness. It comes and it goes, right? That's the nature of Christ in us. Now, what is it that the Lord is doing? He's transforming that nature of Christ into the character of Christ. Now, what's the difference between nature of Christ and the character of Christ? 
character of Christ means that it's stable. It doesn't go away. Now, uh, you know, I used to, I mentioned to some of you, we used to meet in Flushing, New York. And you would go to the Lord's table in the morning and you'd be, you know, worshiping the Lord. You'd listen to a great message. You'd, you'd, you'd be like, wow, that was a wonderful meeting. you feel like you're on a spiritual high, right? Once you get out of the parking lot, you drive in the city streets of New York, and then someone cuts you off. And you're like, oh, what are you doing? Right? Like you start to complain, you start to honk, you lose your temper, you lose your patience. So that's what happens. It comes and it goes. But what is it that the Lord is doing? He's transforming the nature of Christ into the character of Christ. What does that mean? And some in the beginning, maybe we have a little bit of gentleness, and then it goes. And patience, it comes and it goes. It spurts. But then one day, if the Lord has his way with us, that nature of Christ will become the character of Christ. So that one day, you'll see it, maybe an elderly brother or sister, or not even elderly, a, a, a young brother or sister, you say, wow, there's something about that brother or sister, that that sister is a gentle sister. Nothing ruffles her feathers, right? She is a gentle sister. That brother, he's a patient brother. It's no longer just that he has patience, but that defines who he is. That is the character of Christ. It means that it's solid. It doesn't go anywhere. You see that? With the diamond, it becomes hard. It's, it's like nothing will move it. Now, the Lord said, I came that you may... I want you to bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Now, we have the fruits that we eat, like um, like, like bananas and, and grapes, and etc. But did you know? I should be careful here because I'm not botanist, but that some uh, nuts are actually considered fruit as well. Now, what's the special feature of nuts? They're hard, right? So that your fruit should remain is, if you leave a peanut sitting there, I think it, will, it could last probably five years and it'll still be there, right? If you put a banana there, it will go bad and disintegrate, right, in a few weeks. So you see, I, I, that you may bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. What is the Lord doing? Is that something lasting. So now the character of Christ is emanating from that person. So brothers and sisters, isn't it interesting? The Lord said, you are Peter, right? You're a little Petros. Upon this Petra, I will build my church. What is the end result that we see in New Jerusalem? I think we need to read that uh, to understand. What is the end result of the Lord's work? In Revelation chapter 21. And um, verse 10, And he carried him away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It refers to her because it's the church. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and the, 12, uh, and the gates 12 angels. And names are written on them. Um, and then we'll continue on. Um, verse 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Um, and then um, verse 16. The city is laid out as a square. Sorry. Um, let's keep on going. Um, oh, verse 18. The material of the wall was jasper. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Um, the foundation of the stones were uh, jasper, sapphire, etc., etc. And um, and then it goes on to say, I saw no temple in it, verse 22, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So, brothers and sisters, here you see the, the city. It's laid out as a square, huge square. But what do you find there? 
that there are 12 foundation stones, which are the 12 apostles. Brothers and sisters, that was just the beginning. But upon that, those 12 foundation stones, you find the whole city. And the whole wall is like clear jasper. And um, the, 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 the city streets are made of gold, but transparent gold. Now, we don't have transparent today, but think about it. It's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. So there's probably going to be some new physics there, too. So if you think about it, if you take the same process of, of carbon and give it enough heat and pressure, you will get diamond. But in theory, if you take gold and apply heat and pressure, you should be able to get transparent gold. Now, um, and then in the Bible, it also talks about pearls. Now, what is the story of a pearl? The story of a pearl is there are two types of pearls. There's the... There's the um, the one that comes out of animal life, one that comes out of plant life, regardless of which one. The pearl is formed when, um, what are they called? Oysters? Plant? Oysters, right? So if you take a foreign object, like a dust, piece of dust, and you put it in the oyster, what is it going to do? It's going to secrete something to uh, cover it up and continue to secrete more to to uh, cover that dust up. And then before you know it, you have a pearl. Brothers and sisters, that's a picture of the cross. So Paul said, um, the, the Lord left a thorn on my side, and more than once, three times I asked the Lord to remove it, but the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Brothers and sisters, that piece of dust for you, maybe your sibling, or your parents, or your, your husband, your wife, your kids, and the experience is you're going through a sickness. And what is it the Lord says? Let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow him. It's not to kick it out. It's not to say, go away, right? The, the way of the world is, I don't like you, I'm going to divorce you, right? But for us Christians, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice in our brothers and sisters. We cannot kick them out, right? The Lord said, may they be one as we are one. We cannot have division in the church. That grieves the Lord's heart. Unfortunately, that's the case. But brothers, what is the secret to a happy family life? It needs to be sacrifice. It needs to be the work of the cross in each one of us. For there to be a happy marriage, for there to be, to be a happy family life, for there to be a, a healthy church life. Why is there division in the church? Because Paul says, well, because you're fleshly. You're not mature. But if you're mature, you start to think of others. You start to think that others are more important than themselves. You lay down your lives. Brothers and sisters, this is the work that the Lord Jesus is doing. Isn't it interesting that it's a house? It's basically New Jerusalem is a city, right? And there are different blocks. Now, for the blocks to fit together, there needs to be cutting, right? I'm very different from you. So the Lord needs to cut, cut us in such a way that we can be fitted together. We are being fitted into the house of God. And the wonderful picture of, that we see in the Jerusalem is everything is precious stones, pearls, and gold. Gold speaks of the nature of God. Not just gold, but transparent gold. So brothers and sisters, if you think about the end product, it's a huge lampstand. The whole city is transparent. And what is it bearing? The light. You don't need the sunlight anymore because the, the Bible says that God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its... Okay, the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is illuminated. Brothers and sisters, isn't that like a huge diamond and holding that light? Brothers and sisters, this is a lamp. So this is our testimony to the world that this is the life of Christ, right? So this is the work that the Lord Jesus is doing, that he is changing the nature of Christ and the character of Christ. But it's through different circumstances. So, brothers and sisters, what is the salvation of the soul? Peter says, even though you have been distressed by various trials. Then Paul goes on to say that, and Peter says, this momentary light affliction cannot compare to the eternal weight of glory. Brothers and sisters, there's glory and glory. The glory is when we have been conformed into the image of Christ. We have become like him. So that's why the Bible says, Justification by faith. Sanctification by faith is the Lord doing a work of changing us so we become different. What is glorification by faith? Now, 
We said the body is going to be transformed. But remember, when the Lord was on the Mount of Transfiguration, what happened? Why was there so much glory? Was because there was such a glorious life inside of him that it burst forth, that it shone on his face. So, brothers and sisters, I don't know if you've ever met some saints and you see them and they're always smiling. You're like, wow, they have the face of an angel, right? That's what Paul saw on Stephen's face when he was about to be martyred. He had the face of an angel. This is a life that is transformed. So even your physical appearance will be different because there's such a rich life of Christ in you that there's a smile on your face. Your face glows. That's glory, brothers and sisters. So this is what the Lord is doing. Justification by faith, sanctification by faith, and ultimate glorification by faith. Now we read a verse that says, God predestined us that we may be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, in, in, uh, amongst Bible scholars, there's always this discussion. You probably even heard this at school in your college uh, fellowship. And this big question about predestination versus free, free choice, right? When we're saved, is it because God predestined us to be saved, or is it because we have the free will to choose you know, whether I want to accept him or not, right? And uh, now, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I can tell you this. If you, I'll give you this test. You go back and look up every place where the word predestined said, it is mentioned in the Bible. We read a few of them. Everywhere where it talks about it's predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, or predestined so that we may be to the praise of his glory. Everywhere that it talks about that, it doesn't just talk about the fact that whether we're going to be saved or not, in terms of, you know, born again. But everywhere it talks about God's ultimate plan, which is to change us, and that we may reflect who he is. We may be conformed to the image of his son. We may be ultimately become that diamond that is able to capture that light. Brothers and sisters, that is the real testimony. So when the Bible talks about lampstands, in every city there should be a place where there are people that have already been changed by the Lord, conformed to the image of his son. Their souls now have been are being saved. And then ultimately, one day, our bodies will also be transformed. So, brothers and sisters, this is the work that the Lord is doing today. Now, God is a God of purpose. For each one of you, He has a plan. And we already said that God ultimately has this desire for sonship, that we may become mature, and we may become, uh, uh, we have, may have the character of Christ in us. Then, we will attain to God's purpose for our um, I think this is enough for this morning. Maybe we can bow for the prayer. Lord, we entrust these words back into your hands. Lord, we pray uh, that even though this is a lot to take in, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit can continue to do a, a work of translating for us. Lord, we desire, Lord, that we may become what you want us to be. Lord, we don't want to just be immature kids, but Lord, we want to grow up. Lord, we want to be um, grow into sonship. Lord, to become mature, to, to think of others. Lord, that well, one day you can say, uh, this is my beloved son. Lord, we may, um, Lord, just as you served as our example and we went ahead first, Lord, may that be a reality for each one of us as well. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name.